What's up everybody, Rob here. So this is a general overview of pike and shaw formations during the 16th and 17th centuries with particular emphasis placed on the Spanish tercio. If you are interested in that and only that, please go to the time you see on the screen there. So this turned out to be one of my longer videos and I had to cut it down a lot, at least the initial script, to get it down to the length that you see right here. So, for example, I'm not going to really go too much into the specific armor and equipment that were used by um, soldiers in this particular era, so there's really not going to be any discussion of armor. The only thing I'm going to be talking about weaponry would be arquebuses and muskets, as well as pikes. I'm not really going to go into tremendous detail about this. But that pretty much brings me to the point of this rambling introduction here. And that is, um, this is a very fascinating topic that I don't think is covered enough. There's tons of um, videos out there and just like tons of articles and just general interest about warfare during the Middle Ages and also warfare, uh, say, during the Victorian era or Napoleonic era, as well as tons of interest about ancient warfare, ancient Greeks, ancient Romans, Alexander the Great, all those guys. Uh, but there's very little about the early modern era, basically the 1500s, 1600s, and to an extent the 1700s as well which I find to be somewhat of a shame because this is very interesting stuff that I think is oftentimes overlooked. So in any event, this is the start of a general overview of warfare during this particular era, and I'm just going to be doing a number of these videos where they, I just give basic general guidelines. If you're already very familiar with this topic, you're probably not going to learn anything particularly new here. This is more for people who look at things like, you know, okay, I, you know, I'm really fascinated by warfare in the Middle Ages, but what happened after that? So this may give you just kind of like a primer just to give you an idea. And, um, this is not the start of a series, I'm not going to number these or anything, but it's going to be just, um, I'm going to be giving um, a number of videos coming out, and not only that, I'm going to be going into other subjects as well, um, there's going to be no particular rhyme or reason to it, um, but I'm going to be definitely putting them in a playlist of basically warfare, just overviews of warfare during this particular era. So, topics that I wouldn't be covering in this video, but will be showing up in later videos, definitely will be showing up, are things like arms and armor. Uh, you know, detailing how armor changed over time, as well as detailing different types of swords and other weapons beyond, you know, beyond just like pikes and muskets. And there were different types of firearms that were used, and you know, just all that stuff in much greater detail, just didn't have a place for it in this particular video. Uh, likewise, uh, how cavalry and artillery would be used, and um, also fortress design, you know, like the castle turned into the Tres Italian style uh, star forts, and how that all turned out, and how that, you know, came into being. And of course, other subjects as well, such as um, a possibly biographies about Maurice of Nassau or Gustavus Adolphus. I could also possibly go into specific campaigns as well, such as, um, you know, the Italian Wars in the early 1500s and the other wars of religion, the Eighty Years' War, uh, the Thirty Years' War, of course, that was, you know, very popular as well. Um, maybe stuff like the English Civil War, the New Model Army, Cromwell in Ireland, because that's not going to be controversial in the slightest. But, you know, just basically, you know, leave a suggestion in the comments if you have any particular subject you want me to cover. I am by no means an expert on this subject. It's just something I found to be interesting, and I figured I'd share what I learned with all of you guys. So if there's anything you're unclear on or anything you want me to cover in a in another video, if it's feasible for me, I, I make no promises or guarantees at all. Uh, just, you know, by all means, though, leave a comment below. And, um, yeah, thank you. Okay, so I've wasted enough of your time. Pike and Shot Formations, Spanish Tercio, General Overview. All right, let's do this. So our story begins in the late Middle Ages with this guy here. This is Charles the Bold, the Duke of Burgundy. Now, for reasons I don't particularly care about and I'm not going to get into and aren't particularly relevant to our story, in 1476, Charles invaded Switzerland. He got an army together, the core of which was based around knights on horseback wearing full plate armor. Now, uh, the type of armor you see here is not necessarily the types of armor that would have been used by Charles and his army. Uh, this is just a stock image from the Metropolitan Museum in New York City. This is actually the Arms and Armor collection. I am very familiar with it. So he gets these guys. They're all totally pimped out wearing, um, you know, their plate armor. It's all shiny. And you got their, their big, you know, giant war horses. And, and Charles thinks, man, this is going to be easy, man. You got a bunch of dirt farming peasants over there in Switzerland. I mean, come on. It's like it's going to be a slam dunk. It's going to be super easy. Well, unfortunately for him, this was the end of the Middle Ages and going into the early modern era. And notions of knights on horseback, you know, the feudal order was breaking down, and, um, yeah, he ran into a bit of a problem. Actually, a couple thousand problems. Namely, these guys over here. These are Swiss pikemen, and Charles would face them three separate occasions at the Battle of Grandson, at the Battle of Morat, and the Battle of Nancy. 
and at each of these battles, he would be absolutely trounced by these guys. And um, he would actually lose his life at the Battle of Nancy in 1477. So the use of pikemen would represent a massive shift in warfare from the early modern era, and pretty much spelled the end of knights on horseback being the dominant form of warfare. Now, the biggest shift here is the emphasis of infantry over cavalry. In terms of percentages of the army, infantry always was the core of pretty much any force. Cavalry is very expensive, and um, being able to you know, ride a horse effectively in a battlefield scenario, that's a very specific set of skills that takes a very long time to master. So infantry always was, you know, um, in terms of numbers, the the key of any particular army, but it was, the emphasis was always placed on the knights, the nobles on horseback in their armor, uh, their heavy armor, and that being the main offensive arm of any medieval army. But with the advent of the Swiss pikemen, the emphasis was now placed on the foot slogging infantrymen. Now, incidentally, the great leap forward that you see here with the Swiss pikemen is actually technically a step backwards. This was all taking place during the Renaissance, which means rebirth. And what was being reborn? Well, ancient ways of thinking. Greeks, Romans, and other ancient civilizations, their you know, information that had been lost or at least forgotten about during the Middle Ages was being rediscovered, and warfare was no different. Now, a pike had been around for millennia before under the Macedonians, initially under Philip II, and utilized to great effect by his son, Alexander the Great. After Alexander's death, they would continue to be used as the dominant form of warfare by the successor states, um, you know, Ptolemy and all those guys, up until the time that the successor states were in turn conquered by ancient Rome, and, well, this was just kind of a rebirth of something that had been centuries old. There is nothing new under the sun. All right, just to show off the strengths and weaknesses of this new method of warfare, I have out here some miniatures. We have the Perry Miniatures Wars of the Roses set. We have the Mercenary Infantry uh, right here. You can see um, they got the pikes right there. And just to pat it out behind them a bit, we just do have um, also from Perry Miniatures Wars of the Roses Infantry. Um, I just had them just have part of the army here just to show, you know, just a general idea. Any case, so you got these uh, pikes here. And um, they have to be arranged in a phalanx like this. And this shows the great strength of the pike as well as the weak. Now, a pike is a very long and unwieldy weapon. They can be anywhere from about 12, 13 feet on the shorter end, all the way up to 18 feet, possibly even longer. So we have these very long pikes here um, that pretty much are useless outside of this very dense formation. Now, they would people would be arranged, uh, back in Macedonian times, would be arranged in um, a phalanx, a very dense phalanx, and there's really no difference here. The Swiss did this. Um, you have these guys here. These are mercenaries, uh, representative of mercenaries during the Wars of the Roses, and they would be brought to England by Henry Tudor, uh, later on Henry VII, and um, basically in his bid to claim the English crown, end of the Wars of the Roses, Bosworth Field, all that stuff. Now, the great advantage, while they are in formation, these guys are all but invulnerable to pretty much anything that can be thrown at them except another phalanx worth of pikemen. So, basically, um, I know their pikes are sticking upwards at the moment, but if you have the pikes, just say, imagine they were lowering down this way, and they're in multiple rows, so you would, uh, the guys in the back rows would have their pikes over the shoulders. There'd be a continuous row of pikes from the front line, and then just say an enemy, you got these guys here, I'm just, you know, these are more parry miniatures. Um, these guys charge up. They, these guys would get stopped right there on the first line of pikes. If they somehow manage to get past that, they manage to duck, maneuver, whatever out of the way, they're going to get stopped by the second line of pikes who are now holding their, um, their pikes over the shoulders of the guys in first, of the first line. And then behind them, there would be the third rank would have their pikes out. And then the fourth rank. And so there'd be a continuous line, you know, there'd be a line of pikes, there'd be another line of pikes, and then there'd be another line of pike heads. And so in order to get through it, uh, you just have to basically deal with this absolute forest of sharpened points that um, really it's all but impossible for you to get through. Basically what you have here is a gigantic mobile fortress that is impervious to pretty much, well, anything. A cavalry charge would get stopped cold right through here. You can possibly break through with infantry, but you're probably going to take some pretty heavy casualties along the way, and it probably just isn't even worth it. So uh, it's, it's a very, very effective defensive posture here. Um, the problem, though, is that um, you must maintain this formation. If, um, you know, this very densely packed shoulder-to-shoulder -shoulder mass, if there's any kind of break in the line at all, um, if somebody drops his pike, if, um, say, for example, um, they were to charge for any reason, like, you know, at a run or anything like that, they'd break up their formation, and there'd now be, you know, gaps in the line. They're, oh, these guys here, they want to run after them, right? So, 
they break up their formations. So they break up their formation and now there's gaps. And with these gaps, the enemy can run through and absolutely wreak havoc. So in order to maintain um, any kind of military effectiveness, they have to maintain unit cohesion. They have to be in this solid, impenetrable mass. There's simply no other option. They must be in one solid phalanx. All right, another liability of the phalanx in the, this very densely packed formation here was a vulnerability to ranged units. As you can imagine, um, something like this is just basically an artilleryman's dream. You have any type of field artillery, which was coming online at this point. Even um, Charles the Bold actually brought a few cannons with him on his ill-fated campaign. Didn't really do him much good. Um, but this is just a dream for those guys. I mean, it's like, you know, densely pack, packed mass like this. They're just going to get, these guys are going to get lit up like a Christmas tree. Uh, likewise for crossbowmen, um, longbowmen, if um, we are talking against the English here. Um, not really all that much. I don't know of any uh, longbow, off the top of my head, I'm sure it happened. But uh, longbow versus um, pike block, you know, uh, battles. If there is, uh, leave, leave it in the comments, let me know. But in any case, um, yeah, any type of range unit, this is a perfect target. So we have artillery, we have uh, crossbows, bow and arrow. And, of course, a brand new invention, or not quite brand new, but a relatively new invention, firearms. Okay, so you have here are some very early, very primitive firearms. Now, firearms had been around for a couple centuries at this point. Uh, the Chinese invented it, I want to say, in the 9th or 10th century AD. They invented gunpowder. Um, eventually, they created uh, rocket type weapons with it. Uh, eventually, gunpowder did come to Europe via the Mongols in the 13th century, I want to say. Europeans adopted it pretty rapidly thereafter and saw the military applications of it. Uh, during the Cressy campaign in the mid-14th century, the English brought several cannons with them, and actually there were several cannons and um, um, artillery pieces at the Battle of Cressy. Uh, they did virtually nothing, but they were there. Um, there originally, um, as a personal infantry weapon, there was, um, something called a hand cannon, which is exactly what it sounds like. It's basically a little mini cannon that you hold and you, you know, got to balance it. It's, not, it's on the end of something that looks like a broomstick. You kind of tuck it under your arm and you point it in the general direction of the enemy and you hit it with, um, a burning match and, um, or, you know, like a little open flame and then you, that would send off the bullet. Eventually, this would be replaced by something known as the arquebus, or um, harquebus, I think is the, the French word. I don't know. Depends on who you talk to, which one's which. I personally don't care one way or another. Eventually, that would be replaced by something known as the matchlock musket. Now, uh, the difference between a musket and an arquebus, um, muskets are larger. They have a larger caliber. Uh, however, the, the line between an arquebus and a musket is pretty arbitrary. So really it depends on um, who you talk to. Um, some muskets at this point, they had a massive ball that they shot at, uh, that you would shoot with them. And um, sometimes up to and including one inch. So that would be one caliber, like 1.0 caliber. Um, eventually armies would standardize this. The Brown Best musket, which is a couple centuries after we're talking here, would be, I think, standardized about 75 caliber. Uh, the French, um, likewise, would standardize theirs to, I think, 68 caliber. Um, but those were muskets. So generally on the larger side, I think roughly over half an inch or, you know, 50 caliber is a musket. Um, and below that is an arquebus. However, the distinction is pretty arbitrary. So if someone says something different, yeah, probably believe them. Point is, uh, these things have their own, like the pikes, um, you see, uh, range there behind it. These things have their own sets of strengths and weaknesses. Okay. Now the strengths of the early firearms are pretty obvious. Um, firearms are loud. They are really, even today, firearms are really loud. And that's actually incredibly intimidating, especially on a battlefield. That is something that, you know, when you have this thing in your hands and uh, people at this point in history were not particularly used to, um, like, th there were no movies or anything like that at this point. So having an explosion, something that creates literally this loud crackling thunder and, you know, hundreds of guys do it, belching out this big plume of smoke, um, you know, that's kind of would freak people out, which is actually why um, firearms would be used. Um, I mean, a crossbow, I mean, maybe not a low, um, a high power crossbow with a, a winch, you know, that would have a low rate of fire, but a crossbow, you can get off more shots per minute. Um, a longbow, definitely you can get off. If you're a skilled uh, bowman, you can definitely get off more shots per minute. So why would anybody use, um, firearms? And one of the reasons is the psychological factor. You would just, you know, freak people out. 
Also, uh, likewise, there's a certain degree of strength using a longbow and um, a crossbow, again, without a winch or any kind of lever like that. You just need to, you know, muscle it. And um, something like this, something like these, um, um, I'm going to presume that these are, I can't, I can't tell, the, they're little mini models, I can't tell the caliber. I'm just going to assume that these are, since they are early, that these are arquebus, these are arquebuses. Um, anybody can learn how to do it. If you have functional um, limbs, you can be taught how to do it. It doesn't require any degree of specific physicality. Um, you know, really anybody can, you know, go through the multitude of steps. There's a lot of steps, but anybody could learn it. So it doesn't require as much physicality in there. So that's another advantage as well. So you can put more, it's, um, you can put more soldiers into the field and thusly you can increase the firepower. Um, and these guys here against a dense phalanx like this at a distance would absolutely shred it. They could absolutely 100% uh, just decimate a tightly packed mass like that. Um, however, there are some problems. Now, the first problem is, of course, like I mentioned, the reloading. Um, matchlock muskets and um, arquebuses, you can probably, if you're skilled, you can get off one to two shots per minute. Maybe two. Um, yeah, that's about as much as you can expect from these things. Um, they are not like flintlocks. Uh, flintlocks you can get off about three, maybe four if you're good. The Prussians actually had a method with the flintlocks. You can get off uh, six a minute. Uh, don't plan on hitting anything, which actually brings us to another point. These things were horrifyingly inaccurate. Now, these things were a vast improvement over the hand cannon. Uh, this thing you just kind of tucked under your arm. Uh, because if you'll notice, let me, let me bring it up here closer. It is shaped, an arquebus or a mus musket is shaped like a modern infantry rifle. It's got a stock, it's got the barrel on it. You, you had this novel idea. You can actually look down the barrel at what it is you're shooting at. And then um, by when you, you know, actually can look down the barrel, you can sight it in properly and actually hope to get it somewhat on target, which was a vast improvement over the hand cannon, which you just kind of had to tuck under your arm and pray. Um, that being said, these things were smooth bore, which means that the ball in the, um, in the barrel will be rattling down the barrel and wherever it rattles last is the direction it's going to go. So if they could be firing, uh, not the scale here, yeah, I know even, even with the scale here, this would be maybe a couple, you know, couple, like maybe like 20 feet or so, but you know, at any significant range, um, they could be firing, you know, at this guy here and it might hit this guy here. It might go flying over the heads. It might embed in the dirt. It could go flying, you know, tear up some of the pikes you know, way above their heads. It, who knows? There's no way you can predict this. So these things were very slow to reload, very horribly inaccurate. The other major problem was the formations that could be used. And the thing is, they couldn't use a formation. And this was due to the fact that these things were liable to explode. Okay, so basically, um, the reloading process, I'm not going to go through all the steps involved. It, I think there's like 40-something steps in the official manuals that came later, but that's neither here nor there. Um, basically, involves, there's a, a Pan on the side, you fill that with gunpowder, you, there's, um, you pour more powder down the barrel, you take the bullet, you pour that, you put that down the barrel, you ram it all home, you um, then have to take a burning match cord, which is basically just a string, you load it with um, something like quicklime, which is uh, basically a, well, it's a flammable liquid substance, and you um, would have this quicklime coated match. Uh, would cause this uh, piece of string to smolder. You would then fit that into the jaws of the, basically the hammer, and um, and then you would, you know, point it at the enemy. You would pull the trigger. The trigger would um, activate the hammer. The hammer would strike the pan. The pan would ignite and, you know, cha see your chain reactions. Cha uh, chain reaction would happen and the bullet would fire. Okay. So basically, the problem was you are now holding a burning open flame source. I mean, it's it's more like a smoldering, it's not an open flame, it's more like a smoldering flame, but you got this smoldering rope, um, this open ignition source, you're holding it in your hands with one hand, with one hand, you have gunpowder in your other hand that you're now actively pouring, um, so there's a bunch of loose particles flying everywhere, on a battlefield while you're being shot at. All it takes is one slip, or if, say, you get shot yourself, or, you know, something happens, you know, you can slip and fall on wet leaves, you know, any one of, like, a million things that can happen on a battlefield. Uh, you sneeze too hard. Um, some of this powder that you're now pouring will then pour onto this open match, and it would cause a reaction, causing you to explode. And then the person next to you, so this guy explodes. Then, because of him, the bits and shards and pieces will cause 
this guy to stumble possibly and um you know cause him to explode or he you know just explode the powder that he's carrying directly causing him to explode causing this guy to explode and basically you now have because of one guy slipping or one guy making a mistake or one guy getting shot at the most inopportune time you now have half of your um half of your guns um now exploded um, as you can imagine, that was pretty detrimental. So, um, unlike what you see in um, traditional warfare, you think when, when you think muskets and muskets in warfare, you cannot be shoulder to shoulder. This is not Napoleonic era uh, where they used flint locks, which were much safer and more reliable. Um, you couldn't do that. So instead, what they had to do was spread out. They had to be in an open order. Now these guys, because they just they come on the, uh, the, they're somewhat next to each other. They'd actually be further apart than this. But this is just how it came in the set, and I'm just gonna leave it at that but you'd have to be in something resembling an open order um so because of this um they are safe from blowing up but at the same time though they are now extremely vulnerable like i said they had a very low rate of fire and they're horribly inaccurate they're now um separate from one another so there's no coherent mass it's like you know you got the phalanx back here you have this solid wall of um of pikes there these guys aren't there they're separated they're individual you know they're basically individual soldiers and, um, and this was in the era before the bayonet had been invented. Uh, people hadn't quite figured that, that out yet. That would, uh, come about, um, a couple centuries later. Uh, late 17th century, there would eventually be the plug bayonet, and then the ring bayonet would come after that, but, uh, we're not nearly there yet. So, um, the only defense these guys had, um, up close would be either swords, they would carry that, daggers, hatchets, and oftentimes they would just, uh, grab the musket by the barrel and swing it like a giant club. As you can imagine, this was not particularly effective, you know, especially against pikes and, of course, against um, a well-timed cavalry charge. So you have these guys here in open order um, without any real type of uh, defense against, you know, close combat. These guys were highly, highly vulnerable. All right, so the big question of military planners was, how do we utilize the strengths of the phalanx and the strengths of the, uh, the new firearms that were coming online? Um, while at the same time minimizing their weaknesses. And there were many different uh, ways they can do this. Now, oftentimes it would be uh, having the um, the pike block in the back uh, basically as the main offensive arm and the, um, the firearms up front as skirmishers. Again, this uh, takes advantage of the fact that they're in open order. They would be used, you know, to skirmish with the enemy, break up their formation, and uh, honestly to um, confuse the enemy because these things would put off a giant cloud of billowing bluish white smoke and that would obscure uh, movements and um, basically just make things difficult for the enemy to figure out what's going on. So um, having them as skirmishers like this was highly effective. Also oftentimes um, the firearms would be used on the flanks of the main uh, pike block here and again they would be in more open order than this and they would um, fire at the enemy, fire at um, enemy musketeers, and fire at the enemy phalanx. And then if they were pressed, because uh, again, they would still be in much, um, they would be too spread out, they'd be in open order. If there was a problem, they could simply duck behind the pikes for protection. Getting a little messed up here, but you know, you get the, you get the idea. They would duck behind the pikes for protection, while um, the pikes would be able to form basically a mobile fortress and screen the... Um, screen the gunners if they were pressed too closely, and then when the enemy was uh, beaten back or um, should the situation call for it, they could then just swing out and resume what they were doing. So this combination of pikes and early firearms spread very quickly throughout the continent and soon became the dominant form of warfare throughout Europe. Pike and shot formations were, of course, spread throughout Europe by the Swiss mercenary pikemen. Uh, Swiss mercenaries were famous throughout Europe, and likewise were other groups such as the German Landskedek, like you see here. But this was the early modern era, and people were looking for constant ways to improve things, especially military technology. I mean, this was a time of the wars of religion, and just was generally a very bloody time in Europe's history. Uh, really, when wasn't a bloody time in Europe's history, but whatever, that's another story for another day. In any case, uh, people were trying to figure out what is the most effective way. There's got to be a better way, a more efficient way of managing pikes and firearms, and the solution came from the Spanish. So here we are after over 20 minutes, the crux of what I was wanting to talk about, the Spanish tercio. Now the word tercio is Spanish meaning third because originally the tercio would be divided into three parts. This eventually would be dropped. Um, originally the three parts would be pikemen, musketeers, and swordsmen, although the swordsmen would eventually be phased out over time. 
Now, in addition to being a strategic and tactical unit, the Tercio was also an administrative unit, which was a shift from feudal forms of warfare, which were basically nobles raising feudal levies and um, mercenaries and that sort of thing. And these were uh, basically very similar to what we have today, where you have a professional standing army with a very specific administration, chain of command, and a degree of professionalism, which is one of the Tercio's great strengths. So each tercio consisted of about 3,000 men. Each one would be led by a mestre di campo. Tercio would then further be divided into 10 and later 12 companies of 250 to 300 men each, each one of these under the command of a captain. And each of these captains would then be assisted in his duties by a sergeant major and a furrier, which is a rank that's sort of in between sergeant and corporal. It's been dropped from modern military parlance, but you know, there you go. In any case, these companies would then further be divided into roughly platoon-sized units of about 30 men each, which would then be led by a corporal. So I'm sure you can see the parallels between what you have going on here with the Tercio and with modern militaries. And that was one of the main keys of the Tercio's success. While other nations at this time relied on part-time levies, still again based somewhat on the feudal system, which was falling apart, but whatever, uh, there were still uh, part-time levies based on a semi-feudal type system, and they used mercenaries whose reliability was dubious at best. Um, the Spanish Tercio, however, was made up of a standing army of professional soldiers from Spain. These were This was a national army that was loyal to the crown, and they had a very high sense of discipline and a very high sense of esprit de corps. And uh, this would prove to be absolutely crucial in many battles throughout their history. This high degree of organization also assisted the Tercio in that it allowed orders to be transmitted quickly from the commander of the Tercio all the way down to the lowliest officers very quickly and effectively. Now, the Tercio could and often did fight as a single 3,000-man unit. However, individual companies and even platoons could break off and be detached from the main Tercio to complete specific objectives, and this Again, with the orders being relayed very quickly and effectively from the top, a single unit could break off and um, basically do whatever it needs to do without having to disrupt the f movement of the entire formation. Now, generally speaking, pike blocks are pretty slow and not particularly maneuverable, you know, formations, and no, they're generally not. However, because of these innovations, the Tercio was able to maintain a degree of tactical flexibility that their opponents could not even hope to match. Now, the Spanish used their new methods of drilling and discipline in order to maximize the effectiveness of their muskets and arquebuses. Now, um, they did so by, first of all, they placed their men in very specific formations, basically a block formation. They would normally have their men in ranks of 10 deep. I only have three here because, you know, one, two, three ranks. Um, just so you know, this is a rank. This is a file. So, yeah, there's um, four files, three ranks. That's how it goes. Point is, um, they arrange their men in gr uh, groups of 10 deep, only have three here, and they instituted a new method known as volley fire. So like I said before, muskets were supremely inaccurate and hard to reload, and so the Spanish went, came around this by um, having all the men in the front rank all shooting at the same thing at the same time. Maybe something will hit. It's, you know, law of averages is on your side. Now, in order to make up for the fact that these guys um, were slow to reload, and um, they would be, you know, they would be uh, very vulnerable at this point, uh, right after they, um, after they fired. So after they gave fire to the enemy, they would go to the back of a lot of the column that they were in. They would counter march to the rear, and then the ranks in front of them would move up. Of course, it'd uh, it'd be a lot more elegant than this, and all the other ranks would move up again. There would be ten deep. It would be um, a lot more elegant than this, but there you go. Now. While these guys were in the back here reloading, these guys would then open fire, again, at a prearranged signal, all at the same time, at the same thing. So there'd be a constant barrage of fire. Instead of, um, up to this point, uh, volley fire hadn't existed, and pretty much every gunner would just shoot more or less at his own pace. And um, the enemy would be receiving sporadic fire, and um, if they could time it properly, um, you know, a very well-placed cavalry charge or um, even an infantry charge, if you know, depending on the distances, could possibly sweep them from the field. But basically, you know, you'd have these guys give a volley, they'd move to the rear, and then by the time the enemy recovered from this one massive blast, these guys were now in position, so the enemy figure out what's going on, they would get another, these guys would give their volley. So it would just be a constant, um, you know, barrage of fire. So they fire... And then countermarch to the rear. Fire, countermarch to the rear. So the enemy was under constant pressure from the muskets 
virtually constantly. And then, again, with, it would be 10 ranks deep. By the time um, this front rank was... Uh, uh, these guys here would be in the front again. They would be ready to reload, and they would uh, just be able to um, continue the, the pressure on the enemy. The great strength of the Tercio was its combined arms. You had the defensive staying power of its pikemen, while at the same time you had the offensive range capabilities of its musketeers. And this is most apparent in one of its most famous types of formations, the Bastioned Square, which is what you see here. The pikemen would form a hollow square in the center of the formation, while at each of the corners, the musketeers would form into groups known as sleeves. This formation allowed musketeers free rank to shoot at the enemy without getting in the way of the pikemen, while at the same time giving them a place to duck back to should they be pressed by the enemy. They can just simply duck into the middle of the hollow square and um, are now protected by a wall of pikes, while at the same time the pikemen were able to maintain their unit cohesion and basically form this solid block, which is their great strength. This is referred to as a bastion square because it does somewhat resemble the uh, bastions on the new Trace Italian style fortresses, which is a new innovation in fortress design over traditional medieval style castles. It'll probably get its own video eventually, someday for me, maybe, maybe not, I don't know, we'll see. Meh, eventually. But um, yeah, so it does sort of resemble a mobile fortress, which is exactly what this was. This was a mobile fortress. Um, with its bastions and, you know, it could, you know, move against the enemy and was very difficult to deal with. All right, so this is just a very, very crude diagram of how a tercio would work or how tercios would work on the battlefield. They would be arranged in this hedgehog type pattern. Here you got a bunch of bastion squares. You got four of them here. You have the pikemen in the center uh, forming the main square and you have the musketeers on the outside on the smaller squares here This is not to scale by any stretch of the imagination now. They'd oftentimes be deployed in this hedgehog pattern um, Kind of like this dragon tooth design where you have the leading edge of the rear and Pretty much even with the trailing edge of the Tercio in front of it. So you have you know, so just say for example um, an enemy is here and they're advancing this way. I can't draw to save my life. I think you should have understood that by now. But they're under, they're advancing that way. The musketeers from these squares would be shredding into the enemy. They would just be absolutely using their very disciplined volley fire um, that, again, the Spanish were the first to adopt it and other people did adopt it, but the Spanish pretty much did it better than anybody else at this point. And they would just absolutely rip these guys to pieces. And by the time the enemy got to the pikemen, if they even got that far... The pikemen would be there fresh, ready to go, and they would simply wipe out whatever was left. So the enemy thought, okay, well, let's not hit it head on. What we're going to do is we're going to go after these muskets. We're going to hit them, you know, this way. Okay, well, you're going to get fire from the muskets, these muskets on the way in. You're going to get fire from these muskets as you loop around. These muskets are going to fire. And then but when you get close enough, this, this block here is simply going to duck inside the hollow square, and now they're protected by the pikes. Now that you're, they're protected by the pikes and you're stuck on the, um, uh, trying to dig out the muskets from the pikemen, you still have this tercio, uh, sorry, this pike block here tearing into your formation. And then you think to yourself, okay, fine, I'm going to go around, I'm going to go completely around the side, and I'm going to hit them from the rear. Okay, great idea. As you go around, just say you're out of range here, and you come in, you know, you've managed to outflank them, and you come in, and now you're behind them. Great. You're now getting fire from this t from this musket block, from this musket block, from this one, and now this one. You're getting fire from all these different angles. And if you do manage to somehow get close enough, any of these uh, musket blocks could simply duck inside of their tercios hollow square, be protected by their pikemen, and you're still going to be under fire from all the others. Now, sometimes on a battlefield um, with the smoke and the confusion and everything else, you wouldn't notice um, the space between the lines. That's oftentimes why they were in this particular formation, is that the enemy would oftentimes be trapped and tricked into attacking right down the center. You know, right down this way. Um, they wouldn't see this tercio right here. So what would happen is uh, they'd come in this way, they'd see the gap and think, okay, we can get in between these guys and, uh, you know, cut them off from each other and, um, you know, basically just, you know, blow a hole in, in the enemy's line. Well, not really. As soon as they moved in here, then this one would then be, this tercio here would then be in a perfect position to advance. They'd be getting fire from, in this case now, 
three different directions from the tercio below it, from the tercio on its left and on its right, and would be absolutely eviscerated. This was an incredibly effective series of tactics and one that was very, very difficult to deal with. So all these things together made the Spanish Tercio probably the most feared military unit in Europe in the 16th and into the 17th centuries. The Tercio's capabilities and discipline became particularly apparent after the Battle of Pavia in 1525, and soon Tercios and Tercio-like formations were adopted throughout Europe. The Tercio would form the core of Habsburg armies throughout the 16th and 17th centuries during the Wars of Religion, during the Eight Years' War against Spanish Netherlands, and of course the Thirty Years' War against, well, pretty much all of Europe. The decline of the Tercio began in the early 17th century with the innovations of Maurice of Nassau, who's a stadtholder in the Netherlands, who utilized the more linear formations of the ancient Roman. This would continue under the innovations of Gustavus Adolphus, the King of Sweden, who would trounce a Habsburg army at the Battle of Breitenfeld in 1631. Well, history, of course, is not so simple. At the Battle of Nordlingen in 1634, the Tercios would triumph over the Swedish army. Now, there's some debate as to why. Um, personally, it's a combination of things, I think. Uh, the commander, Gustavus Adolphus, who was basically the genius behind the Swedish innovations, had been killed two years earlier at the Battle of Lutzen. Also, during the battle, large sections of the Imperial Army actually did turn and run and were driven off by the Swedes. However, the Spanish Tercio, with its you know professionalism and its increased discipline, managed to hold their ground and actually win the day. So, yeah, it's a combination of the discipline and um, uh, esprit de corps, as well as the Swedes not having Gustavus Adolphus as a commander. Combine that all together and, you know, the Tercio managed to triumph over this new linear style of warfare. In spite of this, the writing was on the wall, and the dense pike blocks that were used throughout Europe during the 16th and 17th centuries were pretty much being phased out in favor of more linear formations. Uh, technological innovations, including the use of the bayonet as well as the flintlock musket, made linear formations much more possible. The tercio would continue on throughout the 17th century. However, the exact formation would change over time, adopting these more linear tactics. In 1704, the pretense was dropped and the Tercio was disbanded, replaced by regiments. All right, that is it for the video. I think I've wasted more than enough of your time. I did have to cut a lot out of here. There's a lot of information on this and there's a lot of aspects I could have gone into and that would make this even longer and I just don't think um, you guys would appreciate that all that much. any case, uh, please hit the like and subscribe button. More videos coming out whenever I get around to it. Have a good day or don't have a good day. You're adults. Have any day, kind of day you want. See you later.